Hey, how's everyone doing this afternoon? So you have made it through the first day of WordCamp Atlanta 2019. Congratulate yourselves. Everyone looks mostly awake. Um, I hope that there was like coffee and soda out there uh, to get this afternoon. Um, this is going to be a little um, theoretical, a little on the shorter side, um, because it is warm in here. Um, I, um, I'm Gary Kovar. I'm a back-end developer at Modern Tribe. Um, if you've heard of Modern Tribe, you've probably heard of us because of the events calendar plugin. I don't know anything about the events calendar plugin because that's an entire part of the company that I don't work with. About half the company is product and half is agency. Um, so I work on the agency side. Um, we're mostly doing uh, WP sites or um, WP sites with a lot of um, weird um, third party things happening. Um, we work with like, some big clients um, like Harvard and Stanford and Disney and Microsoft. And those are fun because those clients do things like say, we have crazy unreasonable time to first byte requirements, or we have um, actually scoped everything, which is neat. Um, but we also work with a lot of medium and smaller sized clients um, that through the process of like, uh, you know, looking at what their requirements are, we find some neat ways to clean up their really messy um, data and make it work faster. Um, so this talk is going to be about alternative data stores uh, in WordPress. Um, this is a table of contents. Uh, I kind of wanted to put this out here, um, mostly for my own um, recollection as far as like what I hope to accomplish in this talk. Um, there's no prerequisites here. So if you're not like a hardcore dev uh, in PHP every, every day, um, we're not going to look at a ton of code. Um, there's, uh, there's definitely a version of, of this talk that has that. But we're just going to talk about these tools um, as options for speeding up your site. So um, we're going to talk about how WP currently stores data. Just a quick look at MySQL. Um, we're going to talk through three different categories of alternative data stores. So custom tables and views, Elasticsearch, um, and then Redis memcached, uh, generally caching type stuff. Um, and then I want to walk through three real, real world examples where I've used something other than um, like core uh, tables. Um, and then just some real quick implementation notes, and then we can get into questions. Um, also, because it is um, May the 4th, Star Wars Day, I um, have picked all Star Trek images. Um, <laughs> so how does WP storage uh, work, right? So WordPress, when it's not a multi-site, when you install it, um, has around a dozen uh, database tables. Um, it's, uh, if you've got like an older site and you upgrade, you might have like links and stuff hanging around. Um, but generally, the way they're related is you're going to have um, like the object and the object meta. So users, user meta, post, post meta, term, term meta. Um, Following that logic, WordPress really has like two kinds of data, or two models of data storage, two things. Um, I'm going to omit users um, because um, users is a very concrete thing and pretty well uh, mirrors how uh, post and post meta are set up. Um, so posts are a thing that have very defined properties um, as evidenced by, if you look at the post table, right? Look at the post table, there's an ID, there's a title, there's an author, there's a date, uh, post type, et cetera. Um, it, and those are all very sensible things that you would need for a post or a custom post. Uh, with that, then, any extra attributes that we want to define generally end up in the uh, post meta table. The other model is uh, taxonomy terms, right, uh, in that relationship. And, and the sole purpose of taxonomy terms is to provide um, an indexed way, a fast way, to find those posts, right? Um, these are like super sensible defaults. So as WordPress developed, like this became like a nice way to say, here's a general purpose CMS that you can um, extend however you need. The, um, uh, the, the nice part about this is that WordPress, in addition to that, then builds in all the APIs you need. So to register a CPT, like you don't write a single line of SQL. Um, I mean, generally, you just call one function, and it's you know, a handful of strings in an array. Um, but there are situations right, where those defaults don't make sense. And using alternative data stores can help us in those situations to keep sites performant. Uh, so the three, uh, I keep saying three um, because something about off by one errors in programming or whatever, right? Um, we're talking about three things. MySQL, um, which is structured query language. Uh, it's relational, immediately consistent. Um, Elasticsearch, um, we're going to talk about a, a bit more. Um, it's really like a search database, no SQL thing. Um, you just pass it documents. It's eventually consistent. Uh, Memcache and Redis um, will... Um, you, you probably like think of them as uh, caching uh, data stores, um, and that's, that's generally where you're going to use them. There's a benefit of those being available, and we'll get into that as well. 
So, heading to the first one. Um, when I explain like how Myas or how WordPress stores data to non-devs, right? The easiest um, way to explain it is think of it like a giant Excel document with a bunch of tabs. So the tabs being the different tables. Um, people like immediately understand Excel because it's it's nice and square. Um, I think MySQL spooks folks when you think about you know like well I've got these weird relationships and stuff happening. But if you can paint it as each table is its own thing and they're related to each other, it, it becomes a bit easier to digest. So interacting with custom tables and views, um, we already have the stuff to do that, right? It's built into the WPDB class. Um, so you can write direct SQL um, and do um, whatever you need to do. So the, the positive for using a custom table or a view, and I'll talk about those, uh, how, to, how to create those uh, in a few more slides. Um, the positive about those is you know that you already have the tools you need. Like it's built into WP Core. You can work with tables and views and custom tables and, and views. Um, the negative is uh, it's still MySQL. So you can still shoot yourself in the foot and write slow queries and, um, and that kind of thing. I want to quickly differentiate between custom tables and views. I think custom tables is something we're all probably familiar with. Views might be something that um, we don't use often. Uh, so if you think of a view as nothing more than a virtual table, um, combining other tables, right? So instead of, instead of like writing a massive query that's always, always has the same uh, subquery somewhere within it, um, you write the subquery once, it becomes a view. In MySQL, it's no more efficient to do it that way, um, but it keeps your code uh, a bit easier to understand. Um, so Elasticsearch, um, it's evidenced by the name, it's, um, it's great for search. Uh, it's, it's a document store, so instead of passing um, like a, an array or object that has like a key and value, you give it this you know, crazy nested JSON object and you define some attributes. Um, and then uh, Elasticsearch does this thing where it ingests it and it sends it out to different nodes in Elasticsearch because it all requires like more than one piece. Um, and eventually it's consistent. I, eventual consistency pops up a few times in here. And what that means is when you put that document in there, um, you might ask with a search for something that that document should return back with, and you may or may not get it right away because Elasticsearch has to replicate across all its nodes. So the node you stuck it into might not be the node that you're directed to when you ask for it. Eventually it'll show up, but it's, it may not be an immediate thing. That's the limitation of Elasticsearch um, that, that pending load you may never run into. Um, under high load, it's, it's something you'll definitely run into um, and limits how we use ES. Um, Great, so Redis Memcached, this is the third one. I'm gonna group these two together a lot. Um, the first note uh, in difference um, that really matters, actually really, well, there's a couple of those. The first one that really matters is um, Memcached has a limit of like one megabyte of data per thing it stores, uh, and Redis is 500, does anybody know five? I'm pretty sure it's 500 megabytes is the limit. Um, so both of these uh, things are a key value. So you give it like a unique key, you give it whatever string, so serialized or JSON or whatever thing you're working with. Um, when you need it later on, you say, hey, I want the value that's at this key. It's fast because it's all in memory. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great way to work with things. Uh, I will, the other difference, uh, uh, starting on to Redis and Memcached, um, Redis is not just a key value uh, data system, it does some cool lists and that kind of stuff. So if you're working with a more complex data structure, Redis might be a value. This is, this is like a MySQL though. Most likely you have this available with your host, one or the other, um, which means most likely you can use some kind of composer package and interact with these things. Okay, so we're now gonna get into the part where we talk about like, how can you actually use these things, right? So we're gonna pretend that we have a client that says, um, I, uh, I have a geolocation requirement, and that's like I have some stores, right? Um, and I want to uh, store the latitude and longitude of those stores. We're not going to talk like how that actually happens. Um, we're just going to assume that we've created the CPT. Um, we've created a meta box that captures this latitude and longitude, either address and figures out after the fact or whatever. Um, so, like the normal method we need um, to get this. Oh, hold on, I duplicated my notes. Cool, um, so, normal, so if we save it this way, right, we put latitude and longitude in, uh, in post meta. The, the stinky part about post meta is that um, the meta value um, 
is set to long text. So long text, we're kind of getting in the weeds here. I said we weren't. I lied. Um, long text is, the limit is four gigabytes of data. So none of us in this room would do this. But there's po it's possible that there are some like plugins out there that would be abusing the post meta table and slapping um, tons of data in there. If you're using text fields for search in MySQL, um, search queries uh, are not performant because the server has to call each object individually and scan through the entire thing, right? Whereas if you're using like integers or in the case of latitude, longitude, you define it as a float, um, it's super fast for MySQL to zero in on this. Um, so long and short, like any lookup you do in uh, post meta, um, the meta value has the potential to be slow. I'm not going to say it is slow, it has the potential to be slow. So uh, this, is, this is like the, the code. This is, if you were doing geolocation, right, this is the formula um, that you would pass in to figure out the distance in miles from the latitude and longitude that was passed to you by the user, however the user passes that in. Um, this would give you like 20 results uh, where the distance is less than uh, 25 miles. Um, so I, I, I don't, this really doesn't matter except to get in your head that um, you're looking at um, that whole sub thing down there, right, where you're doing like cosine and all, sine and radians and all sorts of math stuff that um, maybe like computer science folks know. I don't, I don't know. It's like magic, right? But it gives you the distance, no matter what the latitude and longitude is, um, for whatever's queried. Um, so if we were going to do this, right, with the, with the, uh, the default WordPress uh, post meta table, um, you would want to figure out a way to create a query that would put that latitude and longitude in line with the ID. Um, it's going to be a gnarly looking thing. Um, you're probably going to have a couple left joins or a couple subqueries, and, and at the end of the day, you've written something that's not going to be continuously performant, especially as you continue to add things to post meta. So the first option is we create a custom table, right? Um, the benefit is that when you save, you can say, all I need is the ID and the latitude and longitude. That becomes a subquery, and then you can pass to your WP query on posts in ARG the results of that subquery. Um, so just three columns, ID, latitude, longitude, uh, and it makes that, that query we looked at two screens ago um, a lot faster. Um, if you haven't created a custom table before, uh, the function you're going to want to look at is called DB Delta. Um, first, check if the table exists. If not, you can create it and, and off you go. It's that simple to have a custom table available. Um, so in this case, we would assume that on post save, we're just going to stick that into the, uh, the latitude and longitude into the custom table. So the next alternative, continuing that same, same path, is um, if we were to create a view. Um, this is a bad idea, but like just for the point of conversation, we'll assume we did that. Um, let's assume we created a view using the query from just standard post meta that now looks like the table we defined in the previous screen. Um, the problem here is all we've done is hide a non-performant query in a view um, to make ourselves feel better as a dev looking at this simple to read data versus what was there previously in post meta. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, yeah, uh, you could do it. There's just no good reason to. Um, so Elasticsearch, this is, this is like, like the right solution in this case. Um, Elasticsearch has this concept of geopoints. So if you're using a plugin, um, talk about this later, ElasticPress is kind of like the de facto standard. Um, or if you've rolled your own way of ingesting posts into Elasticsearch, you can, um, you can assign the geopoint based on latitude and longitude. Um, and so on subsequent, subsequent searches, after ES has indexed that, um, it's going to be like an immediate search. Um, ES generally responds in like, you know, dozen milliseconds, you know, for most, most sensible stuff. Um, so this is going to be like amazingly fast. It's going to feel a bit like magic, um, especially if you're coming to it from like a post meta lookup. Uh, the last one, continuing, so like the Redis memcached, um, there's like not a good benefit of using a key value situation here um, because you're going to end up putting so much data into Redis or memcached um, and you run the possibility of evicting data that you do need. Um, in Redis or Memcached. Uh, so I'm only including this for completeness in the four or the three that we were talking through. Um, I will say one caveat to this is if you have only a few, um, few locations and you're, um, you're using this location information like as a JSON object, at this point 
you could just use um, Redis as like what it's built for uh, as an object cache, or what we use it for in WordPress generally as an object cache, and just dump that string in there uh, and pass it to the front end without having to do any kind of query lookup um, except for getting one value from, from Redis. Um, so that's, that's the first like, uh, example um, sample. The next one, um, this is the one that excites me the most, right? So the uh, task runner, like let's assume the client comes and says, I don't know, my site's slow when people check out, right? Um, that's like a very like, broad, loaded, like, well, there's probably a billion things we can do. Um, here's one that's like a simple win um, that I've started doing on most sites. So we implement um, the idea of a task runner. I want you to think about like when you go um, in WooCommerce and you check out, uh, there's three emails that are sent, right? There's like the uh, purchase confirmation receipt and then the email to the uh, site admin. Every single one of those calls WP Mail. Um, generally, every single one of those is going to have to connect then to an external service and send the message. So you're making three external requests um, that when the person clicks check out, like all that has to happen before they see the checkout page. Um, but for humans, like there's no difference, you know, it's, if, if I get an email immediately when I click check out, or if it shows up in my inbox five or 10 or 15 seconds later, like it, it's not part of the request in browser. It has not diminished my browser experience. So the concept here is we take the WP mail and instead of sending it immediately, let's drop it into a queue and then process that task later on. Um, processing that task later on, uh, we'll get into generally, uh, roughly, but, um, oh, I tend to, do, I jump ahead on slides sometimes. Um, yeah, so serving with an action and related arguments. Um, and, and then you can either run it with WP cron, um, system cron, or there are systems built specifically for this, things like um, Gearman or TaskRabbit that you could say, here are things I need to do, um, and it will handle that. Um, here's the neat thing. WordPress has this built in. So if you've used WP schedule single event and passed like something that's slow to that, you've been using WP cron as a task runner. Um, the, the big gotcha with using WP as its own task runner is that WP stores all cron um, in like one giant serialized blob. So if you have like a bunch of repetitive tasks and maybe you're importing a CSV and you break every line of the CSV into an individual task, which is one of the things I commonly use queues for, um, now you've just made this, uh, this cron serialized thing like huge. Um, and the same deal in the options table, it's long text. So we could be one of those like abusing the, the long text column. So the simple thing to do is say, uh, let's create a custom table. Um, and let's drop the tasks in there, um, mark them as complete or remove them pending, um, pending what you need to do. Um, I think after like Norcross's conversation on GDPR, maybe just delete them, right? Um, yeah, so th this is simple. Create the table. Um, instead of running the task immediately, put it in there and then figure out what your async thing is that consumes those tasks and runs them. Um, don't use Elasticsearch for this because Elasticsearch uh, has that, um, it's eventually consistent, but if you're sticking stuff in there that you want to process quickly, um, that's like, that's counterintuitive or counterproductive or counter something. Um, so uh, with Redis or um, Memcached, you can uh, handle this a couple ways. Uh, for both of them, you could say, let's drop a key in with like some kind of unique ID for the task, and then let's create um, another key value pair that has um, like whatever the key is for a list of tasks, and then a string or serialize something that says, hey, here are the tasks we need to run. The, the flip is on Redis, um, Redis has the concept of lists. So you can actually accomplish this with just one key and value. You can add things to the list and pull it off. Um, and Redis is super uh, great because now you've, you've removed one requirement on yourself for like, well, I took this thing. I need to mark that I've taken this thing. Redis says, well, you've got this thing. I like, popped it off the list. It's already gone, um, which means it's on you to return it if for whatever reason the task fails. Um, yeah, so that's it on, um, on task runners. That's, a, that's like a quick way to recover a lot of time. The last one I want to talk about, um, like real world example, is uh, content syndication. Um, and this is one of those things I've done, I don't know, three or four different ways. Um, and it really comes down to like what the client means when they say, excuse me, when they say content syndication, right? There's a lot of things to consider like from an SEO perspective, um, like duplicate content, obviously. Um, 
like we're not going to dig into that here, but but that's a that's a piece of it. Um, if you're syndicating content, and what I mean by that is taking something that's posted on one site and using it on multiple other sites, very much a um, a hub and spoke model. Um, you could you could easily just say on all the spoke sites, let's just um, consume like an RSS feed or something. Um, but let, let's let's uh, let's see if there's like some better options than that that don't require us to make so many remote requests and whatnot. Um, the first one is on a smaller, let's say it's a multi-site network. On a smaller multi-site network, um, you could on post save on the hub, go ahead and um, switch to blog and insert it on all 15 blogs or whatever the number is. Um, the negative here is switch to blog is is slow. Um, probably doesn't matter so much in WP admin, but uh, you run the risk of, of hitting timeouts pretty quickly um, if you're running any, any real quantity um, of sites. Um, you could also then say, well, let's just use direct SQL then. So I know what I inserted into this primary blog. Let's go ahead and take it, and, um, and then I know the blog ID that I want to insert it into. Um, so I'll just change the tables and go from there. The, the thing we lose there is um, all sorts of great WP core goodness, right? Like, we don't know where we are in term count. We don't know where we are in taxonomy count. So we need to stick that stuff in there. But then we also need to get the result and then map term to taxonomy. We need to map the post meta to the post. Um, all that stuff that just happens automatically um, using WP core methods, uh, we miss out on by doing direct SQL. So contents education with MySQL, like you can do it, but you're creating a lot of hurdles. Um, so this is where views really shines. Um, and this is like my favorite uh, solution for syndication. It only works if syndication requirement is hub and spoke um, because you want to limit the amount of tables you're working with. But um, on your spoke sites, instead of using um, posts <coughs> or post meta, um, terms, term meta, et cetera, uh, create a view and then hook to the query um, and replace the table name. Uh, and the view will be a combination of the primary site and the, uh, the hub site and the, the spoke site. Um, combine them. The only like, potential issue here is that you need to make sure that you set the um, auto increment on the hub sites uh, on the ID high enough so that you're not going to eventually create a conflict. But at that point, then you have effectively merged two sites in multi-site. Um, it, is, it is an increase in one query, but it's still very performant. Um, so uh, using Elasticsearch, um, this, this is a good solution, um, and I see this uh, a lot of times when we need to syndicate stuff and we, we're not doing it within multi-site. We need to syndicate from one WordPress site to a few others, but there's a lot of business logic into what needs to syndicate. Um, in this case, you can also get rid of the concept of hub and spoke. Like you can set some parameters in there um, so that it doesn't really matter who's hub and who's spoke. You can share content um, pretty, pretty easily between sites. Uh, the, the negative to this, uh, obviously, is if you have a bunch of sites in use and they're all sticking data into ES, um, ES is going to be thrashing, so you're going to eventually get to the consistency, but um, on the sites that you're pulling from Elasticsearch, you need to know that just because I pulled something this time, um, you know, it, the, the absence of it next time doesn't necessarily mean it's deleted. Um, so there's that, that weird consistency thing again um, on Elasticsearch. Okay, so um, implementation notes. Elasticpress, like I said, is kind of like the de facto standard if you're working with Elasticsearch. Um, but, but if you're doing something more complex, you have more complex data models. Um, it's, it's not hard to work directly with ES. Um, there's some cool composer packages. Elasticsearch has one. Um, and it's, it's not difficult to create the array. Elasticsearch, uh, the package handles um, the logic of, of then passing it to ES. Um, Predis and uh, Memcache PHP are also the other uh, two composer packages you would use to interact with um, Redis and Memcached. So, that is it. Well, all right, let's get to the after party, y'all.